Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And if you're doing great restorative dentistry, one of the things that you're always looking for is how to increase your bond strength. And I've got one of the world experts, Dr. Matt Najad from the USC School of Dentistry on today, and he's going to give us some great thoughts on this process. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practice Show. Thank you so much for watching and uh, it's crazy exciting. We're actually starting season two, first season. We did 85 episodes and took a, just a little bit of a break during the summer. And now we're back up and running with ep episode 86. And we're trying to keep up with all the requests you guys are asking for. And today is a great one. I've got one of the uh, new upcoming superstars in dentistry, Dr. Matt Najai. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But a couple show notes. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you're watching this, if you have questions, feel free to add them to the feed. And I'll ask Dr. Najad directly and we'll get the answer straight from the master. Or if you're watching this later on, feel free to add questions to the feed and we'll you'll see he'll be getting back to you because we want to make sure you get the most out of this as you're watching these. Now, my guest today, um, one, one of those upcoming rising stars. I always love talking to the restorative dentists who are experts and people out there in the field that are instructors. And then I always love to watch the emerging talent and dentistry. And you're going to love this today. Uh, and he, you can see where he comes from, just that school of thought and the people and the, that he's been mentored by. And you came by way of Dr. Kyle Stanley. He said, you got to have Matt on the show. Is that right? You and, that you and Kyle have been friends for a long time, right? That's absolutely right. We've known each other for going on seven years now, actually nine years if you count the last two years of dental school. That's awesome. Now you're out there instructing, you have a practice in uh, Beverly Hills. You also teach at USC School of Dentistry and then you have your courses, um, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But tell us about your journey. Where did you start and who was that mentor that you had in dental school that we can both appreciate and how did this all come about for you? Right, right. So I was in dental school at USC and, you know, like a lot of us, I was in there for like business reasons. I wanted to be my own boss and run my own office. And I never really thought that high end boutique type dentistry would be what I was going to get into. But, you know, I came across this one teacher, Pascal Manier, that a lot of us know about, and he just really shaped my career for the best. I mean, he inspired that passion to do the best dentistry, to do the best you can to make it look the best, function the best. It was so different from what other faculty were doing. And at the time at USC, there was really kind of a trend towards these partial restorations and this term that's really big right now. It's called biomimetic dentistry. And I just latched on. I mean, I saw the opportunity, latched on, did a two-year program with him called the Aesthetic Selective learned everything I could. And that's also where I met Kyle, you know, he was in my class, but we became really close friends in that two year program with Pascal Manier. And he's my number one mentor. And then another amazing mentor of mine is David Alleman, who was also a friend of Pascal's. And he is just another guru on adhesive dentistry, the research, the science, stress, everything, you know, adhesion's a complicated topic and all this stuff is so important. So those are my two mentors. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, if people haven't heard of Pascal Mani, just give us a little bit of background on who he is, because I can certainly appreciate him. And he's he's incredible. Uh, but if no one's heard of him, what would you say about him? So Pascal is a Swiss dentist who is very passionate about doing the best, most meticulous dentistry. And he did a PhD program in biomaterials at Minnesota, and he's written a textbook. It's called bonded porcelain restorations in the anterior dentition. And then it has like a little subtitle, the biomimetic approach. And he goes on to explain what that is. But basically, he's done so much research in adhesion and understanding what the intact tooth is like, because that's really the key. A lot of people look at these materials like metals or conia, you name it, but they don't study the intact tooth. And his concept is we have to understand the tooth 
and how it behaves and how it functions, because that's what we're trying to mimic. We'll never be able to do better than a tooth. So he's lecturing on this, doing research on this, and he's written that textbook. And he's just really, really motivational because you see his passion and it's just a genuine passion for the best that's out there. Yeah, absolutely. And today we're going to be talking about a, a really important topic that you're crazy passionate about. And when you talk about increasing bond strength, why is this such a hot topic in dentistry right now? You know, increasing bond strength, because so many of the problems that we're dealing with in adhesive dentistry or just dentistry in general comes down to our appreciation of adhesion and how to properly bond and seal the tooth. You know, we deal with sensitivity, recurrent decay, debonding, and all these things lead us to want to do uh, less conservative restorations because, you know, the tried and true way is has always worked, why would I go and change my ways for something that creates all these problems? But really the key is that the bond is the most important thing. You know, if you can predictably get the right bond strength, all those problems are gone. And then you have all the advantages of not prepping a tooth down, you know, saving more tooth minimizes the incidence of like a root canal. It, it's easier to clean. It feels better for the patient. It gives more options down the road. So it, it's the bond, you know, knowing how to bond well to the tooth unlocks all these different options. In fact, it even prevents your restoration from fracturing or chipping because something people don't understand is the better you bond, the better the material functions. If you take the same exact material and you bond it with like five megapascal bond and I get 50 megapascal, mine's gonna have a better prognosis, more fracture resistance, less likely to chip and fracture because of the way the stress is transmitted through it. Yeah, I, this is so refreshing for me because I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And, and I just, I have to ask you about this because I hear this with you. I hear this with Kyle and Christian Coachman a lot. The push is really towards conservative dentistry. Is that a big deal? Because a lot of times, you know how this works, people that are may have come a, a decade before you, two decades before you, they they sometimes make a generalization about younger dentists not being aware of conservative dentistry. Just tell us your thought, philosophy, vision on conservative dentistry at this point in your career. I, I don't think there's any room for anything but conservative dentistry because I know that with conservative dentistry, we're going to minimize all these problems and patients are very aware of this. Like they come to me and they're saying, I don't want to get a crown. Why does it make sense to shave all my tooth away for a crown? Or this last doctor told me that I was going to have veneers and they shaved away all the tooth or my friend got veneers, but they're actually crowns. They're aware. They know that keeping more tooth structure is so important. And it is the key in biomimetics. You can't actually do better than the intact tooth. You can try to replicate it, but you don't replicate it by taking more away. You have to conserve what you have and build upon it again. So I think that between the patient demand, the options down the road for you know having more to work with later in life, there's really no question that adhesive and conservative dentistry is the way to go. Yeah, it's awesome. And the other thing too is people are going to be living longer um, as we get older. And so the the need for this dentistry to last a long time is very, very important. Now, we do have a lot of dental students that watch this. So okay. can you just describe, you and I, I love the Denton conversation versus enamel. Can yep. you walk me through? Because I love yep. the way you describe that. Can you do that? Right. So an ongoing thing in adhesive dentistry is that you can bond perfectly well to enamel. It's easy. It's predictable. But the second you're into dentin, you know, all bets are off. There's no predictable bond to dentin or the bond to dentin is weaker and um, it's not going to last and so on. But it's actually interesting when you understand adhesion, like just plain adhesion, like industrial engineering applications, you'll see that it all comes down to how you prepare the surface. And the problem is, if you prepare dentin like you treated enamel, you're just missing that that's its own material that needs to be addressed in its own way. Dentin cannot be conditioned the same way that enamel can. That might even mean the product is a little bit different. But when you do it all right, you can actually get 20 to 30 megapascals higher than an enamel bond strength. And that has to do with the fact that dentin's elastic and it's more conducive to forming a strong bond. So roughly speaking to dentin, you can get bond strengths between 50 and 70 megapascals with the right technique, but with enamel, you're in the high 20 to 30 range just because brittle material to brittle material will not give the same bond as the elastic dentin allows you to form. 
Yeah. Now you teach also, and you've had people challenge you on this, but you know, you've been doing this for quite a while and it's a technique. Is that right? Like it's really, it's not so, is it material based or is it more technique based? What would you say? That's actually a great question. It's, you know, it's both, but the technique more or less will apply to any material. So in other words, you can take whatever material you're using and then figure out the best technique for it and improve your bond strength. But that doesn't mean that you can get the 50 to 70. That that does require the combination of technique and material selection. So we do have certain bonding agents that have been tested They've had the longest track record. They show the best bond strength, stability, et cetera. And those are what we generally recommend. But the technique will still work if you understand that it it's going to do the best that it can with the material you provide it. Mm -hmm. And you don't usually see, I don't think you, you mentioned you don't have any debonds or you'd never had a debond. Is that correct? I've, I've never had one of these restorations debond and it's not physically impossible but i don't expect it and we're going on some eight years of bonding without a debond whereas you hear people talking about inlays and onlays debonding frequently in fact i have patients that come and they're talking about this one inlay having come out three times over the last year and they know something's wrong it's technique it's it's technique and materials actually okay and then i have to ask you about the class five around the gum line so tell, yeah. tell us your thought on that one you know, I've heard, you know, people take my courses and I've heard things like, okay, but class fives are, you know, off limits because those will never last more than six months or a year. But it's the same thing. It's technique. You're dealing with the issue of saliva and fluid, keeping it dry, and then an area that is uh, really requiring the best bond you can give. And if you do the right stuff, I've never had a class five come out either, also mm -hmm. going on seven or eight years. But it's not uncommon for people to do the simplified approach, have contamination. And then, of course, if you don't get the strong bond, then it's definitely not going to last. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump in now on the subject of even treating cracks because everybody has a thought process on cracks. You know, give us, let's, let's go into that. What are, what's your thought process on that? Okay. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is, um, restoring the structural integrity of a tooth. So it's not just about putting and sealing a restoration. You have to have the tooth behave in a biomimetic fashion, which means stresses are distributed through that tooth, similar to how stresses distribute through an intact tooth. So when you see like an amalgam restoration with a crack, even without symptoms, that's my discussion point with the patient to say that, hey, this is not biomimetic. This is not normal. That crack is big. It allows bacteria in. These are things we can measure and see. I mean, we can scientifically see that that tooth is flexing and bending way more than an intact tooth. So we go in, we treat that. Now, where do we end that crack dissection? It's a whole topic on its own, but essentially, if we can get the entire crack out, we will. If we can at least get the crack out in the dentin, that would be very nice. One of those concepts that I always try to explain to patients and dentists alike is that cracks tend to spread. You know, you look at a windshield, you get a crack in it, it you know, at the tip, it continues to spread. So if you can at least blunt it at the tip, kind of similar to how they do some of those window repairs where they kind of take a round burr, stop the crack tip, fill it with like an epoxy or a resin, same idea with our restoration. So we shoot for getting the entire crack out into dentin. That doesn't mean in the enamel because enamel does crack. I mean, you look at um, aged enamel and there's cracks that run through it, but cracks into dentin are not considered biomimetic. You don't see that unless a tooth is very compromised and it's showing that it's not able to withstand the forces. Okay. And so I have this question. I'm sure other people that are watching this, you know, describe what biomimetic dentistry is. If you had to define it, what would you say it is? Okay, perfect. So biomimetic dentistry is basically trying to understand the tooth and make our restorations behave like that. I mean, if you literally translate biomimetic, it means lifelike dentistry or a lifelike copy. We're trying to mimic the enamel, the dentin, the bond. And what we do is we look at each of those independently. We figure out the bond strength of enamel to dentin. We figure out the DEJ, which is the junction between the enamel and dentin and how strong that holds the materials together. We also study how stresses are distributed through the tooth. And we're we're trying to copy it, you know, not just in how it looks, but I would say there's four key words in biomimetic dentistry. One of them is biology. In other words, preserving the biology and trying to keep the tooth alive. One is function. One is biomechanics, having similar biomechanical properties. And then the last one would be aesthetics.
Mm -hmm. Very powerful. And now, um, when people say, look, I don't want to switch, you know, or think differently about this, what are some of the considerations you say, hey, look, I know you may not want to, but here are some considerations in switching your thought process around this particular type of procedure. What would you say? So I would say that I have patients, I mean, I have uh, doctors that come to our course and they do this type of dentistry in all different types of settings. They could be the most high end, one patient at a time type of clinic. I have also seen it implemented in more high volume with the right system. You know, like you can implement CEREC, for example, really well and have um, all the right technique going on with the help of a highly trained assistant. It's possible. But for the most part, I would say that it probably doesn't work in every single setting because it does require a certain commitment to giving the best quality. And that does come with a little extra time and expense. So, you know, I think it's really for the people trying to do the absolute best dentistry. I don't think it works very well in low cost settings because it requires too much sacrifice to make it feasible, you know, but there's so many of us that just want to do the best for the patients and our limiting factor is oftentimes just what we know. Right. Or what we believe sometimes. Yeah. So on on that, so, you know, if I'm watching this, I might say, well, that's easy for you to say, but I practice, well, it, like, does this take longer? Is there, is there a different cost involved? Can you walk us right. through that? Yeah, you know, I, th- I would say that in this day and age, a lot of people are doing some amount of adhesive dentistry. At the very least, we see people doing like composite fillings more and more, maybe not so much with the partial coverage, indirect, like inlay and onlay restorations. But the key difference is if you're doing some of these restorations, some of the key differences are just like 100% isolation. You can't, you can't bond well without good isolation. You know, any contamination that you get in there from saliva, blood, heme, etc., it's not going to allow you to get that bond strength. So that takes a little more time. But with isolate, you can make that much faster. And that works a lot of the times, you know, cord and isolate will work for many scenarios. Rubber dams always the preference. So that takes a little bit longer to do. Um, from there, direct composites will take a little bit longer because you're not doing the bulk fill. The bulk fill is not a service to the patient. You know, it can get by for some time, but it's not the best restoration. So I would say some of the big trade-offs are going to be spending a little more time for isolation. Cost of the materials, I, I think, is actually not the biggest factor. I mean, uh, when you break it down per application, I don't think that's going to add up to be a huge difference. And we're all already using some of my favorite materials, like Emacs is a very common porcelain right now. Um, it's not partic- particularly expensive or anything like that. I explain that to patients because they have this belief that like a zirconia restoration is cheaper than this or that. And they think that the difference in price comes from the material. It, not in my experience, because a lot of labs will charge you the same thing for whatever material you use. It really comes down to what lab you're using. But you can do biomimetics with a CEREC. You can do it with any lab out there. I think the major sacrifice on your end would be time, time and energy. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go back to what you just said. When patients, do patients really ask you that? Like, are they doing, they're doing this kind of homework before they come in and see you? So maybe not for everybody, but for me, that's very common. You know, we have patients that call ask my front office staff as if they're experts on biomimetics, like everything about what materials, what bonding. We just tell them, come in for a consultation. I'll be happy to answer all their questions. They want to know what material I'm using. A lot of them kind of cross over into the holistic or biologic dentistry where they want to make sure there's no fluoride and so on. I give them my stance on that. And we talk about how biomimetic is not necessarily the same as holistic dentistry. There's a lot of overlap, but my absolute function, my absolute goals are the biology, the function, the mechanics and the aesthetics. And I believe that combination is the most holistic approach we can have. But if there's a little bit of fluoride in my material because it's the best bond strength, I don't believe that that's biologically a factor, but I do discuss how trading my material for another one will sacrifice another property. You know, it's a give and take. You use one material, you might lower your bond strength. Would you rather have the highest bond strength, the best seal and prevent uh, recurrent cavity from happening? Or would you rather have the material with no fluoride that's, pro- or, you know, with uh, the weaker bond with the no fluoride material and risk all that stuff? So I talk to them, they tend to have a list of materials they want me to discuss. And a lot of them end up comfortable, but they really want to know that you know what you're talking about. They're reading on the internet a lot. I mean, it's surprising. They really mm-hmm. get into it. That is fascinating. We had no doubt that that was going to be a trend. We're just not sure how fast this is happening. And in a market like yours where, I mean, discretionary dentistry is, is, it's a majority of the purchases in your office. Would you agree? 
I would say it's discretionary for them to upgrade to, you know, they need, they need right. dentistry, right? I mean, a lot of them have problems, but it might cost them more to do it this way in the short run. I always tell them, I think it's going to cost them the least in the long run. You know, if we can avoid root canal and retreating that tooth in the next five or 10 years, because it lasts, I think they're going to be so much better off in the long run. But yeah, to some extent discretionary because they could probably fix the problem for a uh, less amount elsewhere. Yeah, I've heard it said so by so many people. Everything beyond extraction is just discretionary. So, okay. so, so we, we it, could always it, it, debate that, right? That's true. Right, Everything. right, right. That's true. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of, uh, it's the worst sin for me to lose a tooth when I can save it. So uh, it's kind of tough for me to relate to that, but I understand yeah. it totally. I, that's what I appreciate about you so much is just because, you know, we're in here to do this the right thing. And when you say, you've heard people say this all the time, my job is to do the least amount of dentistry, but you see very few people really like their whole core value system, their vision, everything supports that. So, I mean, you're on the right path. I really appreciate that. Now, the other thing that comes up with this as you teach this, is this more difficult to do? You, you mentioned time, but is it really difficult as far as the procedure goes or technique? Uh, I think like everything else that comes down to practice, uh, isolation is probably, in my opinion, the most difficult part. Actually right. doing the technique called immediate dent and sealing, that's not difficult. It's it's time consuming. You know, like these things take time. There is some difficult things, like if you're saving a tooth with decay that's going really deep subgingival under the gums, there's this technique called deep margin elevation. And that can be difficult. It, but like anything else with practice, you get the hang of it. But I don't think that the routine inlay, onlay, or composite is difficult. Difficult. I think it's about your goal and wanting to do it and spending the time to do it because um, once you have it all isolated. Yeah. Hey, Matt, we lost you there for just a second. Hopefully he's coming back. There we go. Here he comes. Can you hear me? I got you, buddy. That's the there fun about doing this live sometimes. All right. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So keep, keep on that thought. So, yeah, I don't think it's so much that it's difficult. I think that it's more that it takes that commitment to do. You know, I think anybody can do this dentistry if they want to do it. Right. Now, we this also goes uh, with saying that this isn't for everybody. This isn't one of those things you say everybody's got to try. But can you go a little bit deeper for that? Who is this truly for and define that if you could? I think this is for people out there that are really trying to give the best longest lasting restoration. I mean, I hear people saying that composites are supposed to last five years and crowns, if it lasts 10 years, you know, the job is done. But if you want your composite to last as long as possible, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, and the same with your other restorations, this is it. Like my goal every time I treat a tooth is for it to be the last time we have to treat the tooth. You know, I hope that we have nothing else, maybe minor repairs, but I don't want to go back in there. I want it to last. So that's why I tell the patient. That's what I try to explain in my courses. And if that's the type of dentistry you're trying to do, if it's not just like, you know, rinse and repeat every five to 10 years, then I think this is the way you want to do it. But economically, of course, that does mean certain things. You know, we see a lot of doctors doing less root canals as a result of this, because if you're conservative, you can really minimize on that. We also see a lot of doctors saying that with insurance uh, reimbursements, they can't really afford to do this type of dentistry because it takes too long. So that's a consideration, of course. I mean, we all have to cover our expenses. Dentistry is so expensive. We can't all do everything if our patients aren't actually willing to pay for it or wanting the difference. I think you should charge a little bit more for this type of dentistry to cover those that additional time, basically. So I think if you take a look at your patient base and you see what they're looking for, not every patient wants this type of dentistry. Some would just cost is the bottom line, you know, so I don't think this would work for those. Yeah, that's awesome. What other considerations, any last thoughts you'd have about this, things that we should think about if I'm a young dentist watching this, what would you ask me to consider? If you're a young dentist, I would say, so, you know, I graduated school and I wanted to do this type of dentistry. And once you get started doing dentistry one way, it's hard to break it. In school, I learned how to do it this way and I wanted to keep up on that. So I got my own office practice this way from the very beginning, all excuses out. You know, you give your chance the opportunity to make some excuses, find reasons why you can't do it, and you'll never see anything but why you can't or shouldn't do this. But when you kind of put your mind to something, you find a way. Because I started my own office right out of school. I 
knew how to do dentistry, but I didn't know how to run an office. And I just knew I wanted to do dentistry this way. I took lower reimbursements. I took longer time and I found a way to make it happen. But if you're passionate about doing the best dentistry, you want to develop a name for yourself doing this type of dentistry and attracting the patients that really, really appreciate having, you know, these restaurants. Matt, here he comes. Am I back? You're back, buddy. We only lost you for Bummer. a second. No, okay. I love what I love what you're saying. And um, I just love and appreciate that because I do talk to a lot of young dentists. They're walking into the greatest profession ever and they'll say things like, Oh, I could never start my own practice. What would you just say to that? Because you did it. Just do it. Just, just do, do it. it. You just gotta do it. I mean, if you know you want to start your own practice, you gotta do it. You're never you know, I had a lot of friends that went in and worked at other offices saying, I'm gonna learn how to open my own office after five years of seeing how it's done. Five years later, they still say, you know, I still don't understand insurance. I never got to learn that. So in reality, it's like ripping off a band-aid. You just got to do it, get in there and start learning. If you put your mind to it, it's actually very possible. And it's the best feeling. It's the best feeling to do your own thing the way you want to do it and be in charge. It's awesome, buddy. I'm so proud of you. You're so young. You've got decades of practice in front of you. I have no doubt you know, if you're watching this, you're going to see a lot more of Matt in the future. And Kyle just commented, go, Matt, you are a master. I agree, buddy. So, hey, <laughs> if people now you do a lot of instruction. You, you, I mean, you got a great course coming up here in October. Can you just tell yep. us what is in that course and why should I go? Oh, absolutely. So I was fortunate to learn this stuff in dental school, but we realized that a lot of dental schools aren't covering this. It's going to be increasingly offered. I know that other schools are coming on board. We've seen the transition happening. And a lot of dentists who want to learn this, it requires a significant amount of uh, education in adhesion and materials and techniques. So what we cover in our course is all that stuff. It's a two to four day crash course. So you can do two days where you learn all the techniques with the bare minimum science, like what the bond strength is, where we get it from, what studies show that. And then we have another two days that goes really in depth so that you know that there's tons of research on these topics. You know, there's mm -hmm. so much research in adhesive dentistry. I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people kind of shy away from it because you have all these manufacturers, you have all these different adhesives and they don't all perform well. And you start to go with the simplest approach. You don't know what works the best. So I get a lot of questions on materials technique because of just, you know, overwhelming amount of information. So our goal in these courses is to summarize the research, show you what's being done, show you what I've learned, show you what David Allman's learned. We cover everything from direct composites to um, inlay and onlay restorations to crack removal to cementation, the biomimetic way. And uh, we go into a lot of isolation and the deep margin elevation techniques. So it's a great way to get started. And a lot of people who finish the course go and practice, ask us questions and continue to develop their skills. And they're really happy with the results. Yeah, that's awesome. So we've got a list uh, or actually a link to the courses themselves right in the show notes. So if you're interested, you can just click over there and check it out and um, see more of it. So Matt, thank you so much for being on, buddy. I really, really appreciate it. Stick around for just a second while we say goodbye to everybody else. But if you're watching this and you've got a couple questions, feel free to add them to the feed because I'm sure if you have the question, a lot of other people have the question and Matt will get back to you and answer himself. And so uh, also continue to give us feedback on courses you want to see. I love that. And we'll line them up for you and make them happen. So until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you.